Hi everyone, Dr. Hinky here, uh, and it's exam three re review time. Uh, some of you have already started on exam three, those of you who are ready, uh, but for some of you, if you'd like a quick review, this will be it. Um, I'm just going to go through the, uh, through our learning objectives, sorry, little brain part there. <laughs> uh, our learning objectives for the chapters and just highlight some key points you should focus on while studying. So chapter six on metabolism and energy. Um, you should know the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. So potential is stored energy. Kinetic is energy in use or the energy of motion, like walking is kinetic energy. Uh, the first two laws of thermodynamics you should know the role of heat and the word entropy in those. First law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. There is a finite amount of energy in a given system. Uh, we can't make more and we can't destroy it. It will always be present, uh, but it's not always usable. So we can neither create it nor destroy it, but it can change forms. That's our first law of thermodynamics. The second law um, is the law of entropy. So every time our energy changes form, some of it is converted to heat energy. So it's still energy. We're not losing or uh, we're not destroying that energy. We're turning it into a form that is not usable. So we say it's lost from the system. The reason it's not usable is because heat energy dissipates very, very quickly, and it would require a greater energy input to capture it and condense it back um, to a level where it's usable, then we would get out of it. So it is lost from the system. And what that means is that for all the energy that comes in, we continuously have to replenish it because as we lose it as heat, we can no longer use it. It can't be recycled. Um, so there is no, uh, no system that doesn't require an input of energy, whether that's the planet Earth requiring constant input of light energy from the sun that gets constant energy from fusion reactions of hydrogen and helium, uh, that includes our bodies that need constant replenishment of energy through eating or we'd run out. Um, we want to define metabolism, the sum total of all the chemical reactions in a cell. That includes anabolism, taking small molecules, putting them together to build big, big molecules. We do that all the time uh, to build body mass or catabolism breaking down big molecules into smaller pieces. And from that, we can release energy and we can get the building blocks for anabolism. So those two go hand in hand. Um, you should know where the reactants and where the products are in a chemical equation. I can write a chemical equation uh, with some elements or molecules on the left and an arrow pointing to the right and other elements on that side what goes in, what's on the left side of the arrow are the reactants, what comes out are the products. I can reverse that arrow. So the arrow always points to the products. So the arrow doesn't always, don't always read left to right, read where the arrow points. The arrow goes from what we start with, reactants, to what we end with, products, what's produced by that chemical reaction. Should note endergonic and exergonic, our coupled reactions, just like anabolism and catabolism, we break down big molecules, we get the small molecules that become building blocks for big, big molecules. Um, endergonic and exergonic reactions, similarly, are coupled reactions. Remember these prefixes, endo is into, exo is out of, we'll see these a lot, and then erg is a unit of energy. So this tells us endergonic reactions need energy in, exergonic reactions release energy. We need to put energy in to reactions that build molecules. 
So when we build molecules, those are endorganic reactions or anabolism is endorganic. When we break down big molecules, we release the energy stored, the potential energy stored in their bonds. Those are exergonic reactions. We can capture that energy, do work. Uh, I should know the structure of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That is a nucleotide, so one of our monomers of nucleic acids. It has ribose as its five carbon sugar, adenine as its, its nitrogenous base, and three phosphates attached to it. Uh, and breaking off that third phosphate, there's lots of tension, lots of energy between that second and third phosphate, the bond that holds it together. And when we break that phosphate off, we can capture that energy and we end up with adenosine diphosphate. You should understand how enzymes work and know what the enzyme substrate complex is. When we look at equations for enzymes, the enzyme isn't part of the chemical reaction. So we usually write the name of the enzyme over the arrow rather than, than as a reactant or a product because it's neither. The enzyme is not changed by the chemical reaction. It goes in, it speeds it up, it comes out exactly the way it went in. So the chemical reaction is between those molecules that are reactants and the molecules that are products. The enzyme just comes in briefly to get them together or pull them apart and then it goes on to do that again and again. So you should know that enzymes are a class of proteins. They catalyze or speed up chemical reactions. You should understand metabolic pathways. Uh, typically our chemical reactions in our cells are not going to be one step. They're going to be modulated multiple steps so we can increase efficiency and reduce heat loss. Uh, and each step in a metabolic pathway converts a reactant to a product. That product becomes the reactant in the next step that becomes a product, which becomes the reactant in the next step. And each one of those has a specific enzyme. All enzymes are specific to their substrate or their reactant. So substrate and reactant are synonyms when we have an enzyme involved. Their active site is the exact shape for their substrate. When the substrate lands on the enzyme active site, it forms the enzyme substrate complex. We call this the induced fit model because when they connect, that slightly changes the shape, the enzyme changes shape a little bit to make that reaction happen quickly, reducing the energy of activation. And then it releases the products and returns to its original shape to go back on to do that again and again and again. Uh, I should be able to describe the four main factors affecting enzymatic speed, so the rate of chemical reactions with uh, that are catalyzed by enzymes. You looked at those in lab. And those were temperature. As temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases until we get too high to the maximum temperature. And after that, that heat breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold the protein in its specific three-dimensional shape. When it loses shape, we say it's been denatured. If it doesn't have the right shape, it can no longer do its job. Uh, pH was the other one. There is an optimal pH for each enzyme. That optimal pH is not always seven. The optimal pH is usually what the typical pH for the environment where the enzyme works is. So it might be two in the stomach. It might be 7.8 in the small intestine. Uh, so it changes, it, it's specific to the enzyme. If we go higher or lower than that optimal pH, we will decrease the rate of reaction. So there's a peak at the optimal, the rate of reaction is fastest at the optimal pH and slows as we get higher or lower as we move away from that optimal pH. Eventually, those um, hydrogen or hydroxide ions that measure pH, that make something acidic or basic, will interfere with the hydrogen bonding of the protein and denature it. Enzyme concentration, the more enzyme we have, the faster we can work through all the substrate that's there. So increases the rate of reaction. 
if we increase the substrate concentration, we can increase the rate of reaction until we reach saturation. That's when every one of the enzymes present is working at its fastest rate, as fast as it can. Uh, and then no matter how much more substrate we add, the reaction won't happen any faster, but it'll continue. So we reach a plateau, it'll continue at that same rate. Um, but initially, as we increase substrate, we can increase reaction rate. And then there are some other things like having the right cofactors or coenzymes present that the enzyme needs um, to work. So cofactors and coenzymes are components that can bind with the enzyme to help it to work at its optimal rate. And then take a look at that information on page 108 about enzyme inhibition. How do I stop my enzyme from working? can have non-competitive inhibition, where the product that stops the enzyme from working will bind to the enzyme at an allosteric site. That means somewhere on the enzyme other than the active site. Competitive inhibition happens when the inhibitor binds at the active site. So if the active site's full, the enzyme can no longer um, work on its substrate. So that's chapter six. Chapter seven, looking at photosynthesis. Take your time with photosynthesis and cell respiration. Um, there's a lot of vocabulary, but just knowing the vocabulary is not gonna help. You need to know how the words connect with each other. So um, I mentioned concept mapping is a great way to help with this going step by step, knowing what the inputs are from each step and how they feed into the subsequent step, what the outputs are for each step rather and how they feed in. So uh, we're going to start with the definitions of photosynthesis. It is when an autotroph, an organism that makes its own organic compounds, its own food, captures uh, sunlight, that's the photo part, and synthesis is in it builds glucose from sunlight and carbon dioxide. And then heterotrophs are things that eat autotrophs or other heterotrophs for their glucose source. Stomata, we've got the stomata and the stroma. Easy to confuse these. A stoma, that's Latin for mouth. This is the pore that allows gas exchange in the leaf, uh, it allows carbon dioxide in, oxygen out. You know the function of the chloroplast. This is the organelle responsible for photosynthesis. The stroma uh, is the equivalent of cytoplasm. This is the aqueous solution with all the materials needed for photosynthesis that's inside the chloroplast. The thylakoid is that folded membrane, the inner membrane on my chloroplast, and it's folded into these stacks. They look like stacks of pancakes, and we call those gramma. And chlorophyll is the pigment that's located within the thylakoid membrane that captures uh, solar energy. And you're going to be able to describe the overall process of photosynthesis. Look at that chemical reaction. What goes in? So carbon dioxide and water are my reactants. I need an energy source because I'm going to take those two small molecules and build a large molecule, glucose. So that's one of the products and I'm going to release oxygen as a waste product in this process. You should be able to summarize the light reactions and the Calvin cycle reactions. So the light dependent reactions, the light reactions must be, uh, must take place in a source of light. And that's because we use that solar energy to split water. When we split water, uh, we release that oxygen from the split water and we take that hydrogen and we bounce its electron down the electron transport chain to generate two ATPs. And we use our hydrogen taxi, NADP, to carry the H, the hydrogen, um, over to photosystem one, where it will be tacked on to, um, to the NAD, sorry, the hydrogen will be moved to photosystem one where it's tacked on to NADP to become NADPH. And that taxi will carry it to the Calvin cycle because the Calvin cycle is where we take that hydrogen 
and join it onto my carbon dioxide to get a carbohydrate. So the Calvin reaction, they can take place in the light. We call them light independent because they can take place in the light, but they don't need the light. And this is where we uh, take our hydrogen, we bring our carbon dioxide in, we join those in the Calvin cycle, um, which has three steps. So carbon dioxide fixation, um, reduction, carbon reduction, or carbohydrate reduction, uh, and then regeneration of Ruby P. So we should understand the non-cyclic electron pathway in the light reactions. This is where we get our ATP uh, using that electron transport chain and the enzyme ATP synthase through the process of chemiosmosis. Um, and we need that ATP because we are going to build big molecules from small ones. We need an input of energy. So we're gonna put some ATP synthase in, or I mean some ATP in, and we get that through ATP synthase, my enzyme that synthesizes the molecule ATP. Uh, so you know the three steps of carbon dioxide fixation and then on page 122, there's some information on tropical rainforests and how their destruction and climate change, um, how those are related to photosynthesis. So tropical rainforest uh, destruction, plants, vegetation, those are our big carbon sink. So carbon dioxide sink, as we generate carbon dioxide through the burning of fossil fuels, uh, we're dependent on those plants to take that carbon dioxide up and build biomass. As we destroy large swaths of photosynthetic rainforest of those plants, we are eliminating a sink of carbon dioxide and a source of oxygen. And a lot of that tropical rainforest destruction ends up that it's destroyed by burning. We burn those rainforests down to clear them to make room for agricultural lands. Uh, and that contributes further to climate change by increasing the carbon dioxide load in the atmosphere. So it's sort of a double-edged sword there that uh, increases carbon dioxide and reduces our ability to remove that and generate oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, we want to know the different functions of G3P. Remember at the end of photosynthesis, I have this three carbon molecule called G3P. And the reason we end there instead of completely at glucose is because this three carbon molecule gives us lots of flexibility. I can put two of them together and get glucose and send that to the mitochondria to get energy. Or I can put this together in different ways to get all the components that the plant needs to get uh, fructose, the sugars in plants, to get um, cellulose for the cell walls, uh, to get more and more biomass. So I can make all sorts of different organic molecules. This gives me flexibility. And then we looked at two alternative pathways. That pathway that we examined is called C3 photosynthesis because our end product is this three carbon molecule. So the C3 is for a carbon molecule uh, with three carbons. C4, we are going to end with this four carbon molecule instead. Both of these C4 and CAM are both C4 pathways. Our uh, C4, the pathway designated C4, uh, we find in well, both of these we find in hot, dry climates where we can't keep that stomata open or water will escape, we'll, our plant will um, dehydrate, will desiccate. And so plants have developed different ways to deal with, it, with this. C4 plants like corn have separated out um, the process of carbohydrate reduction based on location, where it takes place in the plant, in the, in the leaves. CAM photosynthesis, we find uh, in a lot of succulents, in pineapples, in cactus, and that separates out that process um, of carbohydrate reduction. That separates it by time, so day and night. All right, in chapter eight on cellular respiration, here, if you track the path 
um, of photosynthesis, we start with an electron transport chain and we end up with glucose and or some something similar to glucose that can be built into car carbohydrates, a carbohydrate precursor, uh, and we release oxygen. Here, we go in with our glucose and oxygen, and we finish with carbon dioxide and water after they've gone through a series of steps, finishing with the electron transport chain. So you should recognize the equation, what the inputs are, glucose and oxygen, and what the products are, carbon dioxide and water. Uh, and we convert 36 to 38 molecules of ADP plus P into 36 to 38 molecules of ATP in this process. So you should know our four phases of cellular respiration. Glycolysis is the first one. It takes place in the cytoplasm and is anaerobic. Then if oxygen's present, we can move into the mitochondria for the prep reaction, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Those are considered the aerobic portions. Oxygen isn't used until the very end, but we can't get to those three steps unless it's present. So you know the function and the structure of the mitochondria. It's our organelle where cellular respiration, the aerobic portions of it take place. You know, the intermembrane space, that's the area between the outer membrane and that inner convoluted folded up membrane. That inner folded membrane is called the cristae. And the matrix is that aqueous solution filling the mitochondria that has all of the parts, all the enzymes, everything else that's needed um, for cellular respiration. For each step, you should know the inputs and the outputs. So in glycolysis, we put our glucose in. Uh, we have to kickstart the process with two ATPs to get it going. We have our hydrogen taxis, NAD. We have two of those. Uh, and we start that process and we split our six molecule, six carbon molecule glucose into two three carbon molecules of pyruvate, two hydrogens, hop into the, hydrogen, into the hydrogen taxis, one in each taxi to be carried to the electron transport chain. Uh, and we generate four ATPs. So we have a net gain of two ATPs because two of those four go back to start the process with the next molecule of glucose. This takes place uh, in the cytoplasm. From our outputs, those two ATPs can go on and be used by the cell. Our NADPHs are going to go to the electron transport chain, so they're going to carry those hydrogens um, to the cristae, to those folded that folded mem inner membrane. And our pyruvate goes into the next step. The next step, I'm going to jump down here to seven. Ooh, don't want to move that. Uh, is the prep reaction. This is just going to modify our pyruvate so it's able to go into the Krebs cycle. So the pyruvate comes in and within that matrix, within my mitochondria from the food that I've eaten, I've gotten molecules that are there that are used in this process, recycled over and over and over again. Uh, I have coenzyme A um, and so I have two molecules of coenzyme A and I am going to attach those to my pyruvate and convert it to acetyl-CoA. So I end up with two molecules of acetyl-CoA. When I do that, I've loft, lopped off a carbon and two oxygens um, from each of those pyruvates. So I release two carbon dioxides as waste product. I do not get any energy, any ATP out of this step, but I now have my acetyl-CoA's, which are a form that are able to enter the citric acid cycle. It's also known as the Krebs cycle or the citrate cycle. So remember, the enzyme 8-citrate can also be the equivalent of an ic acid. So citrate is citric acid. Uh, pyruvate is pyruvic acid. So those are synonyms. 
So my, um, my inputs when I get to the Krebs cycle, so this is a cycle, things go around and around. What I put in gets modified, modified, modified uh, until the last thing in that cycle joins with a new input and we go around in that cycle. Uh, so in the Krebs cycle, my acetyl-CoA's CoA comes in. The last intermediate product in that cycle is oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate joins in with the acetyl-CoA and it becomes citric acid. So citric acid is my first intermediate. Oxaloacetate is my last intermediate. Um, and citric acid is my first intermediate in the cycle. So that's why it has the name citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle after the man who figured out the steps. Um, so the citric acid cycle in the matrix now converts that citric acid to something else and to something else and to something else until what's left is oxaloacetate. In those conversions, it is going to use those um, coenzymes, so cellular respiration coenzymes, NAD, my taxis, my hydrogen cap taxis, NAD. It's going to use six of those, and they will pick up six hydrogens. They'll take them um, off of the citric acid and each of its intermediates. And I have two other taxis, different taxi company called FADH, and two of those come in and each one picks up an additional H to become FADH2. All of those take their hydrogen taxi cab passengers to the membrane, to the cristi, to drop off those hydrogens for the electron transport chain. As I break down my citric acid into other intermediate products, I also lop off some more carbons and some more oxygens, four carbons total and eight oxygens, and I re release those as four carbon dioxides. So now what I'm left with, my outputs from this cycle are those four carbon dioxides that are released. Along the way, I've generated two ATPs, so I have two more ATPs. So, so far in my entire process, I've gotten four ATPs and all of those hydrogen taxis that have gone over to the electron transport chain. I no longer have any of the carbons or oxygens from my original carbon dioxide molecule. The hydrogens have all been taken over to the membrane for the electron transport chain. So now I have fully broken down my carbon or my glucose. There are no more carbon hydrogen bonds. And now I'm going to use those hydrogens as a way to generate all those ATPs. I'm going to do that in the electron transport chain by passing those hydrogens um, to the proteins on the membrane that are going to steal away the electron. They're going to separate out my hydrogen proton and my hydrogen electron. Uh, and they're going to play hot potato with that electron. So that electron, when we pull it away from the proton, has a lot of energy. And they're going to just bounce it down the line from protein to protein in a series of oxidation reduction reactions. And each time they move it, it loses a little energy. The membrane uses that energy to maintain a concentration gradient. It pumps all of those hydrogens across the membrane, builds them up, when we have a concentration gradient, those molecules want to move from high concentration to low. So they want to move across that membrane. They want to come back um, to their electrons. The only way we're going to let them go back is through ATP synthase. As they flow down the concentration gradient through ATP synthase to rejoin their electrons, that now those membrane proteins are sick of playing hot potato with them, so they just dump them off inside the, um, the matrix. And those hydrogens pour back in through ATP synthase. Each time they go through, for every three hydrogens that grow, go through, I am going to get two or three ATPs. And then my hydrogen proton and electron can reunite and be a neutral hydrogen. But all that hydrogen could change the pH in my cell. I need to get rid of that hydrogen. 
Remember, pH is the hydrogen potential. I need to get rid of it. Now, this is where I'm going to use my oxygen. It is going to bind with those hydrogens to become water. And water is one of my waste products from cellular respiration. So I will exhale that, exhale that water. So I get condensation if I exhale onto a piece of glass or a mirror. Um, I'm exhaling that waste product of water. So we say oxygen is the final electron acceptor in cell respiration. And remember through this whole process, through all of these, when anything describes something as being related to the electrons, we're talking about the electrons in that hydrogen. Uh, so that is our whole process of cellular respiration. So we'll go back to number five here. What happens if the cell doesn't have any oxygen? So eukaryotic cells that don't have, um, or that have mitochondria, but there's no oxygen present, have developed ways to continue to get energy so they can survive. Um, in the absence of oxygen, at least for a little while. Probably won't get enough energy to meet their metabolic demands in some cases. In other cases, like for fungus, for yeast, for bacteria that don't have mitochondria but do this on their plasma membrane, um, have this electron transport chain on that membrane. Um, Without oxygen, we can switch to fermentation. The only cells in our body that do this are our muscles. We do lactic acid fermentation or lactate fermentation in the absence of oxygen. So if you're doing an anaerobic workout or a hard physical activity where you're gasping for air because your muscles are demanding more oxygen than your lungs are able to pull in, uh, your muscles will enter a state of fermentation. Uh, Eventually, this would kill the muscles, so we can't do the cells. Any kind of fermentation would, so we couldn't do this forever. Um, and then there's alcohol fermentation, which yeast and some bacteria do this. So fungus uh, can ferment as well. So fermentation, what happens without oxygen, we can't go into the mitochondria, so we can't go to the prep reaction and the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. We would also run out of my hydrogen taxis because going into this process, I only have two NADs. If I have more in the cell, they could uh, come in, but eventually they're all going to be filled up with hydrogens from the process of glycolysis, but they won't be able to carry those into the mitochondria. And so glycolysis would continue as long as there's an input of glucose but all those hydrogens would just be left hanging and that would turn the cell acidic. So it would destroy the cell faster than the buildup of products from fermentation. But um, what those NADHs do now, my hydrogen taxis are gonna come back to pyruvate, the end product of glycolysis, and they're going to put that hydrogen on in a different uh, arrangement or orientation than it was in pyruvate. So it turns pyruvate into something else. Uh, and what it is, what it turns it into is either lactic acid or into an alcohol and carbon dioxide. So the advantages of this are in the absence of oxygen, I can still get energy. Um, I can do this really quickly because I'm only doing one step. So I can get that fast. I can keep things going. I can't keep them going for long though because the end products will destroy the cell. Oh, uh, let's see. And then the uh, last figure about all the different metabolic pathways, you should understand how they can all feed into cellular respiration, whether it's a carbohydrate, which can be modified to glucose or something similar and go right through the steps we discussed. Um, a protein, which first has to be deaminated and then can go into the cycle later, either in the Krebs cycle um, or at the end of glycolysis or um, in the prep reaction, depending on what amino acids we have. And uh, if you are a lipid, you can go into glycolysis 
um, you can go into the process at a later point or fatty acids um, into the citric acid cycle. So it just depends on the molecule, but we get, we have to put some energy in first to modify the molecule to get it to a point where it's ready to go into somewhere. Um, so we don't get as much ATP out total. The end product of aerobic cellular respiration, 36 to 38 ATPs. Um, it is not 100% efficient. Sometimes some of those hydrogens get uh, rerouted for other purposes, for other metabolic reactions. And so that accounting is not exact. It's somewhere between 36 and 38. And then aerobic fermentation only results in two because that's really only that first step. And we end up with a molecule that retains a lot of the energy that's in um, that's still in those carbon, carbon hydrogen bonds. All right, in our last uh, chapter, as we move into uh, move away from the chemistry of cells to cell function, and we're looking at cell cycle and mitosis. So, in the cell cycle, we're talking about going from a single cell through its entire life until it divides and becomes two new daughter cells. Each of those go through that cycle and divide and we end up with four and so on. So you should be able to describe the cycle, the steps in the cycle uh, and know mitosis, cytokinesis and what the mitotic spindle is. You should know the three stages of interphase G1, S and G2 and what happens in each of those. So G1 is growth and function, the cell does its job in the S phase, we synthesize an exact copy of our DNA. So we go from, in humans, 46 chromosomes or the 2N diploid number of chromosomes to that same number, but each one has an identical twin attached to it, a sister chromatid. So a chromatid is a single chromosome. We refer to them as a chromatid after they've been duplicated in the S phase. Now we have that X shape that we usually see that we associate with chromosomes that only happens from the S phase into G2 and until anaphase and mitosis when we pull them apart. So look at the major activities at the checkpoints. We have checkpoints throughout the cell cycle to make sure everything that was supposed to happen in the previous cycle happened so that we're ready to move on. So in the G1 uh, checkpoint, we make sure that the cell cycle, that division, that the, the division, nuclear division, mitosis, the division of my chromosomes, um, and then my cytoplasm, cytoplasm happened correctly. If not, we undergo apoptosis, programmed cell death. The cell gets a message that, hey, something's not right here, and we will not be able to function properly. And so it will um, undergo apoptosis. That is to protect our health and maintain homeostasis. We don't want a cell that is abnormal and can't function properly uh, continuing on because it will just carry on in every cell cycle passing on that abnormality. Uh, so this is apoptosis is a way that our body protects itself. Uh, then we have uh, my G2 checkpoint, which makes sure that in the S stage, all of my chromosomes were copied correctly. And then the third stage is during metaphase. When my sister chromatids are lined up on the metaphase plate, we check to make sure each one is connected to a spindle from the opposite pole so that they are ready to be separated evenly between two daughter cells. You should know the difference between chromosomes and chromatin. So chromatin is what my chromosomes are made out of. DNA uh, wrapped around proteins, histones to stay organized. And the chromosome is the body containing all of my genes. So it's made of chromatin. Um, in humans, we have 46 of these. Different organisms have different numbers. So we use 2N to indicate the total number of chromosomes in an organism. That's the diploid number. We use 2N to signify the total number because we have N 
half that many that we got from our mother and N, half that many that we got from our father. So to make an individual, we need half from mom, half from dad to become a diploid individual. We get 23 chromosomes from mom in the egg, 23 chromosomes from dad in the sperm. They come together at fertilization to give us 46 chromosomes, and then we can become a fully functioning cell. Uh, so you should know that picture, the image with the chromosome, the duplicated chromosome, those sister chromatids, the centromere is what connects them, and the kinetochores are the position, uh, the structure on those that allow the spindle fibers to attach. Should understand the mitotic spindle. It's related to our uh, cytoskeleton for moving things around in the cell. The mitotic spindle specifically are my um, my cytoskeleton fibers that are going to um, separate out the chromosomes during mitosis, and those are organized by the centrosome. The centrosome are those two barrel-shaped structures uh, together. They're the centrosome. Each of those barrels is the centriole. We duplicate that so that we have two of these that go to opposite poles during mitosis. So I have a spindle forming on either side. Should know the major events of mitosis. Remember, mitosis is nuclear division. In prophase, my nuclear envelope uh, dissolves. My centrosomes move to opposite sides of the cell and they form an aster. It's the beginnings of that spindle fiber structure forming from each one of these. Um, and prometaphase, that spindle starts to attach to each of the chromosomes and push and pull them until in metaphase those are lined up, the sister chromatids are lined up along the center line of the cell, the metaphase plate, um, with the spindle from one pole connecting to one sister chromatid and from the other pole connecting to the other. Anaphase, we pull those sisters apart toward opposite poles. And in telophase, we have a bundle of chromosomes, single unduplicated chromosomes at each end of the pole, at each end of the cell or each pole of the cell. So I would have, if I started with 46 chromosomes, I now have 46 over at this side of the cell, 46 at this side. So I started with 46 individual unduplicated chromosomes. In the S phase, I ended up with 46 sister chromatids or duplicated chromosomes. They're identical, so I'm not gonna count them as new chromosomes. They're just 46 duplicated. Anaphase pulls them apart. So I have 46 unduplicated chromosomes here, 46 unduplicated chromosomes over at this end. Um, so I use the analogy in my video of if I gave you a sheet of paper with questions on it for homework, you would have one unduplicated homework assignment. If I took that to the Xerox machine and had two and gave it to you, you would still have one sheet of homework you would just have a copy of it. You wouldn't say I had twice as much homework because you just have one, but you have a second sheet that you can now divide, um, give to a friend, give to somebody else in class. So same thing with the chromosomes. I've made a Xerox copy in the S phase. I don't have any more chromosomes. I just have a copy of the same thing. Then I can separate them out. So I have the same number in each of the daughter cells. I uh, know the steps of cytokinesis as we divide, but the cleavage furrow is where the plasma membrane pinches in. It's pulled in by those cytoskeleton elements um, until it divides all the cytoplasm and the new nucleus between the two daughter cells. And then the cell plate formation in the cell wall where all those vesicles um, containing the precursors for cellulose surrounded by a membrane come together down its center line they merge, they fuse, uh, and then they divide the cell with a new cell wall and additional membrane. Uh, so know the functions of mitosis. Why do we need to make a copy? We end up with new daughter cells that are exactly identical 
to the parent cell um, because they're going to have the same function as the parent cell. We use mitosis to grow from a single-celled organism to a multicellular organism to increase in size uh, and to repair and replace older damaged cells. Uh, discuss why human stem cells continuously conduct mitosis, including the techniques of therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning. So the textbook goes through um, a good discussion of cloning. Mitosis gives us identical daughter cells. That's cloning. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells. They do not know what they are going to be when they grow up. As our cells mature during uh, embryonic development, that mass of cells, of replicating cells. Initially, all those cells have all of the DNA, just like all of our cells do, and all of it is active. Any of the DNA could begin to function. So we call it a stem cell. It can become anything. It doesn't know what it's going to be when it grows up. At some point during develop, development, um, embryonic development, those that mass of growing number of stem cells uh, forms into a hollow ball called a blastula. It's a hollow ball of cells. And then it starts to dent in. So in the first dent in is going to be the anus. And then the other end dents in, and that's going to be the mouth. Um, and then those two dents kind of eventually merge. Uh, and now my cell has orientation. It has a top, a bottom, so a head, a bottom, top and bottom, and it has an inside and an outside. Once that developing embryo has orientation, the cells begin to differentiate. The cells on this inside part know they're going to be part of the digestive tract. The outside cells know they're going to be muscle and nerve cells. Uh, so things now have position. Things at the top portion know they're going to be sensory organs. The bottom portion will be reproductive organs. And so now we can start to turn off the genes that the cells don't need for functioning. That's differentiation. Once they've differentiated, those cells have permanently turned off the DNA that they don't need. So what stem cells do, if we capture those cells early enough, they have the potential to be anything. So in stem cell research, if we uh, put a stem cell, this is an example of nerve damage. Let's say you have a spinal cord injury. Uh, we talked about our nerve cells enter G0. They never undergo mitosis. That's why we don't get new ones. We can't repair that damage. Um, so a damaged nerve cell is pretty much damaged for life. A stem cell that doesn't know what it's going to be if we insert it into that place in the spinal cord where the injury is, it gets signals from its neighboring cells telling it, oh, you're supposed to be a nerve cell. And so it can differentiate into a nerve cell to replace the damaged nerve cell. Um, so, yep, read on the reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning. Uh, discussed in that video, cancer, uncontrolled replication. So this is mitosis gone wild developing into a mass of cells that never differentiated. They have no function. They don't do their job. They just keep reproducing. So they never spend time in that G1 phase. Uh, and the difference between benign and malignant growth. So benign are usually encapsulated and don't spread and are just a mass of cells. Malignant tumors. Um, are not encapsulated. They can have a rough edge because there's nothing surrounding them. Those cells can break off, readily break off, metastasize and spread, colonize other parts of the body, other tissue, uh, and continue to undergo uh, rapid and out of control mitosis to create more tumors. Uh, and then that metastasis is when it breaks off and moves. Uh, and tumors Malignant growth can allow angiogenesis to, con to, uh, to occur. Genesis, their creation of. Angio has to do with vascularization with blood vessels. You can get blood vessels that can carry food to these cells and waste away, waste away from the cells. Um, 
allowing them to continue to grow. Uh, so you look at the causes of cancer, proto-oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, oncogenes, and telomeres, um, which regulate how many rounds of mitosis cells go through. And then we talked about binary fission uh, or cell replication in prokaryotes is asexual reproduction. And that covers all of the chapters that we went through. So good luck on the test, everyone. Um, you have between now and Saturday midnight to take that.